Welcome to part 3 of Neural Networks in CUDA from scratch. In the previous video we implemented the linear layer and today we are going to change our code so we can have multiple layers. We are going to make the code more flexible so we can have a neural network of arbitrary depth. But before we do all that I want to show you some bugs which I introduced before. This is the CUDA kernel we used last time. And while it worked, there is a serious issue with it. Let me demonstrate. These are the activation values we get when we run our neural network with three threads. Remember, the neural network we programmed so far has three output neurons. So each thread has one output neuron. Now we are going to run the CUDA kernel again, but this time with 130 threads. Alright, now let's restart the kernel and compile the project. And as you can see, we now get different results. Two of the three set values are wrong. Do you know the reason why this happens? I'll let you guys think for a second. Alright, the reason we get wrong results is due to out of bounds access. We are using the thread ID as the index for our arrays. This time we have 130 threads. But we only have 3 output neurons. This means the length of our arrays is also 3. But we are writing up to the 130th element in these arrays. This is a visualization of the memory layout in the GPU. The activation values are located at the lowest memory address. There are three activation values. After the three activation values there is empty space, which doesn't correspond to any variable in our code. This empty space is there because CUDA malloc works in chunks of bytes instead of single bytes. In our example CUDA malloc reserves 512 bytes, which corresponds to 128 floating point values. After this empty space are our set values. Now let's visualize what happens when we try to write to the activation values. Thread 1 to 3 are writing to the activation values. Thread 4 is already writing to out of bounds. This doesn't cause any problems yet since this is just unused memory space. However, thread 129 and thread 130 are already overwriting the set values we calculated before. So if we compare the results again, now we know why only the set values are wrong, but the activation values are correct. Also this explains why the last set value is still correct. Since to overwrite the last set value as well, we would need to have 131 threads. So now that you understand the problem, let's talk about the solution. A simple idea would be to just launch the CUDA kernel with the exact number of threads we need. However, this wouldn't work for multiple layers, because we are going to need different number of threads for each layer. We might have a layer which has uh, 50 neurons, and we might have a layer which only has 10 neurons. So what we need here is a memory guard, which is basically an if statement which checks the thread ID and only if the thread ID is smaller than the amount of neurons, we are gonna let the thread access the array. Now we add a if statement which checks if the thread ID is smaller than the number of output neurons and only then we execute the code to calculate the activations and set values. Otherwise we do nothing. Ok, so now we run our kernel once more. 
and we see that the set values are now correct again. Let's modify our kernel so we can handle multiple layers. The first thing we need is a variable which defines the shape of the network. Here you can see a drawing of a neural network. This network has the shape of 8641. We will now use this variable to loop over all the layers. The core functionality stays the same. We are going to calculate the set values and the activation values for each layer one step at a time. The only thing we are changing is that we chain these layers one after another. We need to change our memory guard so the number of threads which are executing is matched up with the number of neurons in the current layer. We get the number of neurons in the current layer by indexing into the shape array. All the threads with an ID lower than the number of neurons in this layer will execute the code to compute the weighted sum and activation values. Let's use this opportunity to also refactor the code a little bit. We're going to change the function signature. First we add the shape array and the length of the shape array to the function signature while also deleting the number of input neurons and number of output neurons integer because this information is already provided in the shape array. We need an integer which tells us the length of the shape because in C++ there is no array length attribute. Remove x inputs since we are going to store the input values in the activation values array. Before we can continue I need to tell you how we are going to store our weights biases, set values and activation values in memory. I'm going to introduce the following memory layout. We will have one big float array for the weights which contains all the weights for all the layers. We start with the incoming weights which belong to the neurons of the first hidden layer. All the incoming weights which belong to a certain neuron will be next to each other in memory. If we want to get the weights of the second hidden layer, we need to start with an index of 48. This is because 8 times 6 equals 48. So from index 48 until index 53 are all the incoming weights for neuron number 1 of the second hidden layer. From index 54 to index 59 are all the incoming weights for neuron number 2 of the second hidden layer. From index 60 to 65 are all the incoming weights for neuron number 3. And finally from 66 to 71 the incoming weights for neuron number 4. On the bottom I spelled out the formula on how to calculate the index for the second hidden layer and for the output layer. Next we take care of the biases array. The size of the array should be the size of all the biases. So for our neural network this would be 6 plus 4 plus 1, which adds up to 11. The set values array is gonna have the same layout. Alright, so now the only thing missing is to define the memory layout for the activation values. Warning, this layout is a little bit different compared to the set values, since we are also going to store the inputs in this array. But other than that, it's pretty much the same. Now that we've come up with a memory layout, we can finish up the kernel. First we define some offset variables for the set values and biases, for the weights and the activations. These offset variables will help us to index into the correct layer. We can now use the shape index to access the correct weights, biases and activations of each layer. First we program the weighted sum. We change the array indices so they also take into account the current layer. Then the activation values 
and at the end of the for loop we are updating all offset variables. Note that it is crucial to do this outside of the if statement. If you don't do this outside of the if statement, different threads will have different offsets. Alright, so there's one final piece to making this code work. This piece is called sync threads. Sync threads is basically a synchronization point where all the threads will meet up. All the threads with an ID lower than the number of neurons in this layer will execute code to compute the weighted sum and the activation values. However, now the issue is that in the meanwhile, the threads whose IDs are greater than the number of neurons will jump over this if statement and continue executing the code below the if statement. Now it can happen that those threads will enter the next iteration of the for loop and start computing weighted sums for the next layer even though the other threads haven't finished with the current layer. So without this call to the sync threads function we will have wrong results in code which isn't always reproducible. Alright, so that's everything we needed to do for the kernel. Now let's change the code in the main function so we can call our kernel and test the code. The first change we are going to make is to remove the lines with input neurons and number of output neurons. And instead add our shape array. Previously we calculated the number of weights by multiplying the number of input neurons with the number of output neurons. However, since we now have multiple layers, we need to iterate over all these layers and sum up the number of weights. Before the number of biases we had was just the number of output neurons. Now we have to take all the layers into account. We are also going to initialize these biases with a few random values. Alright, the size of the float array for the activations now also includes the inputs. We are just going to use the number of neurons we calculated before when we wanted to know the number of biases. We need to transfer the shape of the neural network into the CUDA kernel. This means we also need to request memory on the graphics card to store the shape of our neural network. In order to do this, we are first going to calculate the number of bytes needed, which is just the shape length times the size of an integer. Then we are going to create a pointer to our array, which will be pointing to GPU memory. That's why we prepend it with D underscore. By now you should know the drill and it should be of no surprise that the next thing we are going to do is to call CUDA malloc and then CUDA memcopy. One more thing I added is to set the number of threads to the maximum width of our neural network. So in our case this would be 8. Because we have a shape of 8641. Since we changed the function signature of our kernel, we also need to change the parameters when we call the kernel. So we remove the D inputs parameter and we remove the output neurons and input neurons variable and replace them by the shape and shape length variables. And that's basically it. At the end I added some code to print out the set values and activations of the neural network so we can see the results. So let's run our kernel and see if everything works. Alright, we get some activation values and set values printed out. At first sight they look pretty reasonable. But to be sure I also wrote a small script to verify the values we get here. So we can see that the values from the Python script match the values of our CUDA kernel. This means everything is correct. 
Great, so that's it from this video. As usual, all the code is available at github.com. In the next video, we will have a look at dealing with multiple inputs. Thanks for watching.